All right. So, um, so yeah, so now we've, we've, we've covered sort of all of the technical details of what we can do inside Vinsim and Insight Maker. We now know um, there are certainly more advanced things we can do, um, and those might come up uh, periodically. Um, there are tools inside Vinsim and, Insi Vinsim and Insight Maker that can help you like find feedback loops if you're having trouble finding them and, and do some other things like that. But pretty much from this point on, we're now we're talking about applications. And so we're going to see more and more complex models that are built up from Vinsim and Insight Maker that will hopefully give you ideas of things you can do in your final project and just generally ideas of how these dynamical system models are applied to real world analyses. So of course, um, the real world versions of these things are a little bit more complex than what we'll show here. We're kind of striking a balance between the kind of pedagogical goals and the realism goals. So this lecture sitting in the middle or at the end or whatever this is of a pandemic feels simultaneously current and also a little dated, um, but um, it at least hopefully is as well motivated. So, um, so our first kind of model that we're focusing on here is using these dynamical systems models to think about um, epidemics. And so um, this is a relatively recent article, uh, 2020. Um, so back kind of at the start of the pandemic where, um, where at NPR here, they were talking about how um, in these complex systems to do sort of scenario planning, these computer models can be very sort of beneficial or very helpful. And so that's what they're kind of talking about. This outbreak science was largely a science of using these computer models to try to understand how these things go over time. So if you look at, for example, this is um, Ebola uh, back in 2014 across three different areas in total. If you look at the number of new cases per week, you see it has um, across these three different areas kind of a similar shape. And so if we built a useful simulation model of a disease outbreak like Ebola, then we should hopefully see in our model similar shapes, which allow us to sort of better understand where those shapes come from. And then if we match those shapes, we can then intervene in our simulation model to give us a better idea how to intervene in the real world model. Or we can sort of see which interventions would actually be sort of useful, whereas which interventions will end up not really maybe benefiting in terms of public health and so on. So. So this is kind of what we're building up here is we want to build a model that kind of gives us these characteristics. Now, most of you, at least to sustainability students, you've probably seen the model that we're going to start with today before the SIR model. Um, but we're going to embellish it a little bit so that we can start doing a little more sophisticated scenario plan. So like I said, how many people have seen the SIR model before, like maybe in SOS 101 or something, a couple of hands here. I don't know online anybody if you want to give a gesture or anything um so hopefully okay a couple of comments there briefly so so this will be a little bit of a review but if you haven't seen it that's totally fine so in the so-called sir model of disease spread we model three um separate groups um a population a uh, we partition a population into these three groups and so one uh, subset are the number of susceptible people who've not had the disease. The other are infected people who are currently spreading the disease, infectious population. And then the other are those who've recovered from disease and aren't spreading it anymore, recovered population. So in this simple model, the recovered population down here are immune. These ones are spreading. These ones are able to be spread too. That's kind of the, the three important features here. So, if we think about it, these are our state variables for our system. So we build an SIR model, these are our stocks. So at any snapshot of time, I can ask how many susceptibles, how many infectious, and how many recovered are currently out there. That's why there are stocks. Now, how do stocks change? They change with flows. So we have to, you know, in, in sort of really model the dynamics of the system, we have to come up with the flows. And so the flows in this model are the number of infections. So we should be able to build a model for infections that's let's say maybe based on the number of infectious people that are out there. And that will, um, will end up saying how quickly you get a translation of people from susceptible to infectious. But then these infectious individuals will eventually recover. And so then we can have recoveries in here. You could imagine other flows that I haven't modeled in here, like a death flow. So how many people actually survive this? Well, there could be another group out here, which are the individuals that instead of getting stuck in the recovery group, get stuck maybe in a, you know, in a death group. And that way we could keep track of the mortality over time or something along those lines. 
So um, the way we would model this inside VinSim or inside Maker would be we draw three stocks like susceptible. In, in this case, I'm borrowing um, someone else's diagram here. So they use the term infected population. It's a little more traditional to say infectious because we want to capture the point that they're actually spreading the disease. They're not just infected with it. Uh, but so, you know, for the purpose of this lecture, infected and infectious are synonyms and recovered. And then we have our flows. Infections is an outflow of susceptibles and inflow to infected. Recoveries is an outflow and infected and inflow to recovered. And so what we're going to build up in the next couple of slides is how to actually write the formulas for the flows. Remember, we don't ever update the formulas inside the stocks. We only update the initial conditions. We update the formulas inside the flows. And so that'll mean drawing links to make these formulas work and so on. So does this make sense so far? Are there any questions about this general idea? Divide a population into three groups. Those three groups become our stocks, our state variables for the population. Yeah. If you had deaths that are, uh, could you put it in your next to recovery? So would it have its own Gesundheit. separate arrow? Uh, you, so if you had, you would, you know, death stocks. So the question is, where would a kind of a death stocks be? And um, so I could put it, you know, anywhere, of course. And then I could say, um, you know, where do uh, deaths come from? And if they only come from uh, those who were infected, then I would have an outflow of infected into the death stock. Now, there could be other processes like just natural mortality. So then in natural mortality, I might want to have model an outflow from recovered and susceptible. And so, um, but I might want to keep track of how many people died from natural causes or how many people died from the infection or something like that. So you can imagine partitioning deaths of it. All right. Okay, so, so our next then, Sean, let me see if, no, no change, if there's any questions online. Okay, so, so now, like I said, to really make this model work, we have to use the uh, formulas here. So, um, so the easiest one we're gonna focus on is the recoveries first. So if we think about recoveries, we have to think about what is the process of recovery? Well, it's pretty easy. You get sick, you wait a while, hopefully you recover. So the waiting a while is all we have to model. This is a lot like bacteria, our bacterial population model, where bacteria, they're born, they live a while, and they die. And so um, this, we're going to give a similar sort of outflow from recovery as we did from that bacterial model. So we can ask, just like in the bacteria, on average, how long does one bacteria live? Here we can ask, how long does one person stay sick on average? So we can record that. And like I said, same logic as the bacterial model. So if I know that, then I can say, well, the number of the recoveries is gonna be how many people are currently infected times the recovery rate per person. Well, what's the recovery rate per person? Well, that's just, um, one divided by the average length of an infection. So if you're usually uh, sick for six days, this would be one over six days or whatever your time units would be, whatever six days is in that time unit. And so, um, so that's how we get this exactly the same as number of bacteria times one divided by average life. So that's the formula that we're gonna end up putting inside this recoveries flow up here. So any questions on that? Does that seem like it makes as much sense at least as the bacterial outflow, the death flow. Okay, so we see that we're not modeling death here, but it's the exact same dynamics. So we use the same formula. Okay. All right, so this is our total number of recoveries per day. This is like recoveries, uh, you can think recoveries per person per day, but then we multiply by the number of people and you get recoveries per day. So that becomes our formula that we're gonna put into recoveries, exactly the same as the outflow formula in the bacterial model. So in order to make that happen, I need to draw some links. So I need to add in this parameter, duration of infection. So um, some diseases are gonna last longer than others. You might be sick with something for a day. Um, you might be sick with some other infectious disease for 14 days. And so now I can use the exact same model for both diseases, I just have to change this parameter duration of infection. Now, in order to make this recoveries formula work, not only do I need the duration of infection, but I need the infected population. So I draw those links in, and that will give me access inside this flow to both of those. So the numerator will be from here, the denominator will be from up here, and this will be the formula I put inside this flow here, recoveries. 
Okay. And so um, this is a balancing feedback. Um, why is this a balancing feedback? I only see one arrow going this way. Where's the other arrow? Any guesses? It doesn't look like a loop, right? Because I don't see any other arrows. There's an uh, implied link from recoveries going back to infected population. So I just got an answer online and the, and the statement was, is there an implied link from recoveries going back to infected population? Yeah, so and that's what I'm looking for. That's exactly right. So there is an implied link from recoveries, starting a recovery is going back to po infected population and that is a negative link. And so we got a positive link going forward, a negative link going backward, and that's why this is a balancing loop. So, and that should make sense, because what that says is if I start off with a certain number of people infected and I have no inflow, so they're just infected and nobody else is getting sick, eventually those infected people are all going to recover. And so this is going to go back down to zero. So it's, it's like it's regulating itself back down to zero. That's what makes the balancing loop. Yeah. When you're drawing this diagram, do you have to do the infected population, the blue arc to recovery? Um, you, you well, so, so formally, yes, I'm going to say you do, but some software packages will give you access to this um, just because there's an outflow from it. So some try to make it easy on you. I think Inside Maker might do this. So inside Inside Maker, if you went inside Recoveries, if you didn't have this link, I think it still would give you access to this guy. But because we want to draw these to be clear to a general audience who understands generic stock and flow diagrams, I would say that you should always have this link there, which shows you that this recovery is going to depend upon the number of infected. OK. Any other questions about this? This is sort of the easy half of the diagram. All right. So if we think about it, um, if we want to keep track of how many people have been at the end of the simulation, we want to keep track of how many people, when we stop the simulation, have been touched by this infectious disease. We really just want to sum up the number that are currently infected at the end of the sim and the number who are recovered. And so we can do that by creating a little auxiliary variable that doesn't affect the dynamics of the sim at all, but we might plot it. So we're gonna call this affected population and it's just gonna be a sum of the infected population and the recovered population. That's what I've got down here. And again, that just allows me to plot the affected population. The, um, the downside of this is it gets a little confusing with these extra links here. It makes it look like there's loops here that aren't actually there. Um, so it's a little ugly to make this, to take this sort of, this is auxiliary variable meant for bookkeeping. So what we do is we use those shadow variables or ghost primitives, that's their name in Insight Maker. So I can create a shadow variable called infected population, which is just a synonym for this thing up here. I can create a shadow variable for recovered down here. And then this uh, little affected population, I can put this little triplet, these three things together anywhere I want out of the way. And then that way they don't distract from the main dynamics, which are depicted above. So that's what we'll do there. So that keeps track of our affected and that gives us our dynamic of recovery. Um, so now we have to worry about how to actually, what happens when you get into this infected population. So this is the more difficult um, uh, expression to come up with. So um, what I'm gonna do is transition to one possible solution. So this is from, from this author, uh, again, he's his infected population. And so, um, so I'll highlight first this affected population in programs like Stella, they know that you're gonna do some of this add variables together a lot. So they just created a special node that is a sum. So you can go into that node and I can say, I can sum up any of these variables up there. That way you don't have to create explicit shadow variables and bring them in. So that's, if you see this, um, I think this was, uh, Oh, this is in Ford, but if you see this little plus, I think uh, um, there might be some examples in Moorcroft because I think he also uses Stella that have this little plus. That's all that means is that inside there, it's adding up other variables inside the system. So don't let that distract you too much. So let's focus on this dynamic over here. And this is one hypothesis for how uh, infections might work. So we're going to start here and then sort of... Um, this is kind of, uh, I guess, a um, spoiler alert is that, you know, this will not be the correct hypothesis. So we're going to end up rejecting this hypothesis and finding out we need a different set of formulas. But this is where we're going to start. 
And so we start and we say, well, I know that infections are caused by the infected or the infectious. So I know that my infections per day somehow has got a, there's gotta be a feedback here from the number of people currently infected. So if I think about it, what happens with infected people? They walk around and they bump into others and they infect those around them. So there's got, so I'm gonna create a contacts per day. And, um, and that contacts per day is what's gonna generate the infections per day. And so um, how do I uh, figure out the total number of contacts per day? Well, I'm just gonna say every infected person has a certain number of contacts per day per infected person. Now, this is something I potentially could measure. I could go out and, um, and I could follow people around, assuming, a, let's say an infectious person doesn't act that much differently than, an inf than a non-infected person. Um, I could follow a person around and just keep track of how many people bump into other people throughout a day. And if I had enough people, I could take the average of that. And I could say the average person bumps into six people a day. They get into the range where they could infect them a, a day or something like that. So that is data. I could go out and either take on my own or look up and then load it into that constant. And then I take that number and I multiply it by the current number of infected. And that should tell me how many contacts could have caused infection that day. Now, not all of those contacts actually lead to infection. So you can get within a radius of somebody where you could infect them, but there might only be a 50% chance that it'll actually lead to infection. So you have to be within that radius and then you kind of flip a coin to see um, if there's actually gonna be an infection there. So I could also measure for all the times that people were in close proximity with someone who was infected, how many times did an infection actually spread? That's something I could look at, I could find in data, I could do contact tracing, I could figure that out. And I could put that into this infectivity variable right here. So I've got this variable and this variable that I could actually find in data somewhere. And I can then create this um, infections per day, which is gonna end up being my total contacts per day, which I just talked about down here, um, times this infectivity. And that's what goes into this infections per day. So it seems like a reasonable model for infections. Okay, so any questions about how we got this far? I can maybe summarize that here. Those are our two formulas. So whenever you show a, a, a diagram like this, like on an assignment, um, you know, make sure you list your formulas as well. Okay. So when I look at this, um, I should start looking for loops. And if I zoom in, I can see that there is a feedback loop here. And if I think about it, it's, uh, there's a plus link implied going in the forward direction. And if I look at the formulas here, then I can see that the infected population has a, has a direct, is directly proportional to total contacts per day. And um, so this is a positive link going from infected population to total contacts per day. And then I can see the total contacts per day has got a direct relationship here. So that also has a positive link. So I put all that together and I get a reinforcing loop right there. So the way this is modeled, the more people get infected, the more people get infected in the future. And it's a growth loop. So it's a reinforcing loop, which kind of makes sense. All right, so any questions about this simple model? It's not a totally wrong model, but we're gonna see that it doesn't quite capture all of the dynamics. And then that will come out by simulating it and then seeing things that don't quite match. Okay. All right, so, so this is putting those two sides together. This is our whole simplified SIR model. And if I look at it, I can see that I've got a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop. And so um, when I see reinforcing next to balancing, what sort of archetype do we usually associate with reinforcing next to balancing? Anybody remember? Online as well, if you wanna put something in the chat. I saw people drawing something in the air, which looked good. Yeah. I don't know what's called by those messages. Yeah, that's, that's good for me, actually. Sigmoidal growth, F-shaped growth, limits to growth, all of these are, are good things. So, yeah, so when we look at this, we see, ah, maybe there's going to be an S-shaped growth here because I see a reinforcing next to a balancing. Um, so maybe I'm looking for that, but 
but it's a little more complicated, we'll see, because of these other stocks that are involved. But it's the right feeling we should get here. So let's simulate to see what actually goes on here. So I'm going to, um, I need to set these things up. So um, let's pretend I looked at some data and one out of four contacts, one out of four contacts in close proximity leads to infection. So I'm going to say it's a 0.25 infectivity. I'm going to say that uh, on average, people interact with six other people per day. Um, that, in other words, they get into close proximity six uh, per day. And the duration of infection of the thing that I'm modeling is two days long on average. So I, in stand, so I put those things in there. And then I have to say, um, I need initial conditions on the stocks. And so I want to simulate a population of 10,000 people. Now, the, the genesis of a new disease is exogenous to the system. I'm not, I haven't modeled how the heck the disease got here in the first place. So rather than trying to model how disease starts, I pretend like we forget about that and we start the instant after the disease happened. And so I'm gonna initialize my infected population to just two. So two individuals are infected and 9,998 individuals are not infected. Nobody is recovered. So it's like just after the disease jumped, from, you know, from outside of this population to inside of this population. We don't care where it came from, but it's the instant after this population has contact with the disease. That's how I model it, just changing the initial conditions. So then if I simulate that thing, I get a curve that looks like this. And at first I'm excited because I see S-shaped growth, but it's S-shaped growth in the recovered population. And I was kind of sort of maybe expecting S-shaped growth maybe in the infected population, if you kind of think about where it was kind of positioned. So, um, so in some ways, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's hard to reason through, but at least it looks kind of like what I was expecting. Um, so, you know, I'm not quite sure, but I feel, I'm feeling okay about it. Um, and then, but then if I look at the kind of this middle peak here, I wanted to mimic the infection peaks I see in real data, like this Ebola peak. And it's really sharp. It, like it goes up to a point and then comes down, but all of these round off at the top which is one thing. And then if I look a little bit more carefully, um, down here, this susceptible population, it plummets super fast and then hits zero. And then it goes all the way to here. And that seems weird to me too, because I wouldn't expect that the susceptible population would get burned out that quickly. Yeah. Is there a question online? I just heard an unmute. No. In that case, why am I going to ask a question online, bro? You are. But again. OK, all right. So. Um, so uh, the so the idea here is that this doesn't seem realistic. We would never expect all of the susceptibles to get burned out in finite time. Limits. So. Um, so yeah, generally we want this, we'd probably be a lot smoother here. So the, um, so when I kind of investigate a little bit further, I go into, let's say Insight Maker. And if I look at the susceptible population stock up here, there's its initial condition where I set it. Remember the default value is this restrict the stock to positive values. And that's something I said, we never really want to leave that checked. And it's the default as it is in some software programs. It's really annoying. Uh, but we want to we want to uncheck that because leaving it checked gives us a false sense of security. Because really, what this is, well, we had a model that if we didn't have that checked, we would have got negative susceptibles. This thing would have kept going, and we can't have negative susceptibles. It doesn't make sense to have a negative number of people with a disease or without a disease. And so, if we would have seen that this curve plummeted below zero, that would have told us we're missing something in our functions. So. Just like seeing negative numbers when you're not supposed to see negative numbers, seeing hard corners like this um, is often an indication that you probably need to look into your formulas to see if you're missing something. So that's what we do. We look at this and we say that doesn't quite look right. So what might be the problems here? Does anybody have some guesses of what might be the problems here? Can we, so right now, basically, I'll give you sort of a hint. In the, in, the number of infected is currently the main driver of infections per day. What else do you think might slow down infections per day so that it doesn't have that hard corner? Hmm. 
Any thoughts? What I mean, there's not a whole lot of other options here for what else could be affecting it. Or I guess, but I guess it's sort of like I guess what I'm kind of getting is why might we need the susceptible population in this formula too? Why might it be important to know how many susceptibles there are when calculating the number of infections per day? Yeah. Oh, because less susceptible means less contact per day. That's right. That's right. If there are no susceptibles, there are no infections per day. In this current model, if there are no susceptibles, the model will still calculate infections per day, which doesn't make any sense. Because if there's nobody out there who's susceptible, there can't be any dangerous contacts between infected and susceptibles. So we need to involve the susceptible population. We need to somehow allow the susceptible population as it's burning out to slow down this infections per day. This is actually the whole essence of herd immunity is this idea that as you get more and more people infected or uh, vaccinated, you get less and less people who are susceptible and it becomes harder for diseases to spread. We need to model that. All right, so there's a question. Yeah, people have already been infected. Um, the, the, so the, so, so the, the people who have already been infected are moved off here. And we, um, so we wouldn't necessarily need to involve them in the formula because if they've already been infected, they don't return to the susceptible population. So they're already kind of out and we don't need to worry about them. But those who have not been infected, that's what we need to involve in the formula. Yeah. But even the people that have moved out, could you write them back in? Like, because mutation? Yeah, well, so there's a question is that what, so that there, we'll get to that at the very end here, is that if you're talking about a, um, a virus that, for a number of different reasons, those who are recovered only stay immune for a short amount of time, either due to changes in the virus or due to their own physiology losing memory. Then we need a slightly different model where we need a flow that goes from recovered back to susceptible at some rate. And that's a so-called SIRS model. And so this is a model of a disease where you get permanent lifetime immunity. And, and there, are, there are such diseases like that, um, like, uh, what, like measles, right? So chicken pox, right, right. So um, interesting thing, I think it's, um, I think it's measles that uh, if you get infected with the real thing, you do get immunity to measles for the whole life, but you lose all immunity you've built up that time and have to start over. So it, it wipes out all of your existing immunity, which is sort of yeah, fascinating. It resets yeah, you, right? it resets your system. Um, okay, so that's a tangent. That's why it's so important to get vaccinated for that particular thing. So anyways, um, we got this guy. Um, so this does not depend on the size of the central population. That's kind of the problem here. And we need sort of a formula that does that. So, so that's what's going on here is that um, we allow the central population to plummet to zero. Um, in reality, it should slow down. The infection peak should round off because as the susceptibles become more hidden in the population because there's fewer of them, then, uh, then this rate should fall off and that's what will cause this to be rounded off. So let's, um, and likewise, the recovered population shouldn't be all of the susceptibles. We should have some that escape infection because it becomes so hard for them to be found by those who are infected that they can effectively hide. And that's the so-called herd immunity. And this doesn't show any of that. So, um, so that's what we're trying to work on here. No, no herd immunity at all. So we're gonna get rid of that one, um, not go totally back, um, to the drawing board, but we're going to kind of modify this a little bit. And um, well, it's basically the same model. We still have over here total contacts per day and contacts per day per infected person. But now we have to say not every contact between people is with an infected and a susceptible. Infected and infected, we don't care about that. They can hang out, that's fine. Susceptible and susceptible, we don't really care about. Infected and susceptible, that's the ones we care about. So really we need to know if you bump into somebody from the population, what's the probability if you're an infected that they're a susceptible? And that's what we need to model here. And so I've got this new thing we've added, dangerous contacts per day. And so, um, and it depends upon the fraction, that's FR, fraction of contacts that are with a susceptible. So let's see how that works here. So um, I'm saying up here that the number of infections 
now depends on the number of dangerous contacts per day. So we're kind of going backwards through the formulas in order to help us build these formulas. We don't quite know what the formulas are. So we kind of start with, um, with where we kind of know things are, and then hopefully things bubble out from there. So we know that now the number of infections is not directly the number of contacts per day times infectivity. It's the number of dangerous contacts per day. These are the contacts between um, kind of uh, opposite types, infected and susceptibles together. And then that gets multiplied by infectivity. So it's not that different than what we already had. But now we have to figure out how to calculate dangerous contacts per day. So let's move ahead to dangerous contacts per day. But if you think about that, that's just the total contacts per day. That's this thing up here, which you already had, times the fraction of the uh, number of contacts that are with a susceptible. So this is kind of like the probability that um, uh, I've bumped into somebody with um, uh, who is susceptible. So it's kind of like if I bump into a random person, then I'd say, well, I know 10% of the population is susceptible. So there's a 10% chance that this person is susceptible. So that's how I calculate. This is like the probability the person I bumped into is susceptible. And so in order to, um, so in order to make this assumption, um, this often comes up in models for simplicity. We assume well mixedness. What I mean by that is if you were infected and you immediately knew you were infected, you could probably work to not you know, interact with others who weren't infected. Or uh, you could be quarantined. Uh, you know, there's things you could do that would prevent you from interacting with susceptibles. And that would not be a well mixed population. That would be a population where all the susceptibles were there, and all the infected were there, there'd be a wall between them, or they'd only interact along the boundary so you wouldn't get those over here interacting with those over here. So it'd be limited contact between them. We're making the assumption here that there's none of that going on. There's no quarantining. And so um, anybody can interact with anybody else. And so because of that, um, then uh, we, we the sort of things are well mixed. It's like your balls in an urn, you reach into the urn, you grab a ball out, and those balls could be anywhere in that earth. So that's when we go well mixed. And it just makes the math go a little bit here. This would be a place where you would attack this model. You'd say, real populations aren't that way. When you get sick, you know you're sick, and at least a small fraction of those people might not um, be out because they might be so sick they're at home. They might think they might be sick, and so they might take measures to prevent themselves from spreading the sickness, and so on and so forth. Here, we're not modeling that. This is almost like a worst case scenario. Okay, so, um, so how do we calculate the fractions that are with a susceptible person? Well, that's easy. We're going to take the total population. Notice it's another one of those sums. This, is, this total population is just this box plus this box plus this box. So it's always going to be equal to 10,000 because that's where we started with. And we are then going to divide the number of susceptibles by the total. And that gives us our fraction who are susceptible. And that gets loaded into there. And that's all I'm saying here. So that's what the total population is. So we can put all that together. And this is our complete SIR model. And this is the conventional SIR model. There's a question online. How do you ensure that uh, they do not return to the population um, in the equations? Um, I don't know which they are you referring to. I'm sorry, I didn't catch this question uh, earlier. Um, but the, but I, I mean, the idea here is that if you were infected, you eventually get put into the recovered box. And the recovered box um, is counted in the total, but it's not counted in the fraction susceptible. And, um, and so it, 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 because things are kind of naturally moving around these boxes, then it kind of keeps everybody where they're supposed to be and keeps all the counts honest. So we aren't implementing any sort of quarantining or whatever that would require us to keep more spatial control of things. But uh, so we don't have to ensure that like, there's accidentally somebody who moves from recovered back into infected, or whatever. It's just kind of forced, you know, things are always moving in one direction in this model. I don't know if that gets to it. Okay, good. So this is our full model. Any questions on this model before we see, um, you know, where we go next with it? I'm going to remind you of the formulas over here, and then we'll see with a sim of this new model. So questions on the new formulas. All right, so just as a reminder, these are the old formulas that we had for the back half of the sim. Um, and so we can look at this and they basically have three feedback loops. We have our contagion loop from before and there was the kind of recovery loop over here. And now we have a new loop, a depletion loop. 
And so this depletes the contagion. So now the contagion is growing, but it gets depleted twice. So now this, this is part of the reason why we don't expect necessarily to see S-shaped growth. This growth process is gonna get pinched off by depletion as it's gonna run out of fuel, but then also as it grows, um, it's gonna die off as well. And so we've got these two um, uh, negative feedback loops, one up here in recovery and one in depletion, which control this contagion, that keep the contagion from growing to the sky. All right, so this is all I'm kind of saying here. Okay, so when I simulate, we get something that finally looks kind of realistic. So I start with 10,000 in the susceptible population, well, 9,998, but I can't see the two there. I start with two in the infected population. I get an S-shaped decline in susceptibles. I get an S-shaped growth in the recovered. And the infected have this nice rounded off. There's no hard edges anywhere. So that's cool. So um, I see now that there's actually a gap between the total number of susceptibles and at the end of the sim, the total number of uh, recovers. That's the herd immunity. Those are the susceptibles that the uh, infection rate got so low that it became so hard to find susceptibles that um, what we're gonna see here in a second is, remember this disease only lasts for two days. The susceptibles become so hidden in the population, it takes, you know, basically every infected person more than two days to find another susceptible. But by the time they bump into another susceptible, they're already cured. And then so that point, so that's what causes these susceptibles to escape. The immune, and, um, and so we get this standing population here. So that's where herd immunity comes from. Now, now that we have this idea of herd immunity, we can start asking more interesting mathematical questions. Like what are the conditions that govern the size of this thing here, which govern whether outbreaks spread or die out and how far they spread and so on and so forth. We now can play with this simulated world to better understand that. So, um, so yeah, how does the interaction or infection rate compare to the recovery rate? That's really what we're asking. So I can sort of focus on this mathematically and then I can use the SIM to kind of do scenario planning. So, now that I have this thing and I simulated it and it looks kind of realistic over the time series, I can now go back in this and then use this as a transitional object to sort of change my own mental models of how this infection works. And so, um, and so this is where this, this uh, how many people have heard of the basic reproduction number? And uh, yeah, so, uh, so this, um, so we're gonna get into then where this basic reproduction number comes. Here it's seen in movies, TV shows, now do the whole pandemic thing. Um, you know, you might see it in news stories. And, um, and the basic reproduction number is just in an SIR model, the product of the infectivity, the context per day times infected persons times the duration of infection. That's where we get the number. Now, where the heck does this product come from? Let's see that. So what conditions help us determine how outbreaks spread? Well, I just kind of summarized it a little bit there. A single infected person causes a new infection at a rate of how many contacts they make per infected person. And this is the beginning of the pandemic or the beginning of the epidemic um, where no one else is in fact, where we don't worry about the number of the susceptibles. We assume there's plenty of susceptibles. So at the very beginning of that, then if you are the sole person who is infected, then you take your contacts per day per infected person multiply it by the infectivity, and this is your rate of spreading the disease. Now I take that and I say, well then how, what's your rate of clearing the disease? Well, that's just one divided by the duration of infection. So this is how fast you, in like the speed, you know, it's like per day. This is how fast you clear the disease. This is how fast you spread the disease. So really what we need to ask is which one's faster? Are you spreading the disease faster or clearing the disease faster? And so if you compare those two together, then you've got the infection rate compared to this recovery rate. And I can ask which one's greater. If this is greater, disease spreads. If this one's, this rate is greater, disease dies out naturally without having to do anything. And so uh, rather than having this, uh, you know, this dividing over here, I'm just gonna multiply both sides by duration of infection. And then I get this product of these three things compared to one. 
And this is the so-called basic reproduction number where for every disease, um, it, there is an associated basic reproduction number, which is, a pro which is a function of the disease characteristics and physiology, as well as sort of social constructs. So like contacts per day per infected person, you can control that behaviorally. Duration of infection, you can control that maybe with drugs. So you can actually, um, the, for a given disease, smallpox or whatever, the, reprodu the basic reproduction number can change over time as we get more awareness of the disease and as we get more treatments for the disease. But for any instant of time, we can calculate this for a disease and ask, is it greater than one or less than one? If it's greater than one, then that means we probably need a public health uh, uh, you know, uh, option to help deal with this. Um, we might just need to encourage people to um, reduce their contacts per day, or, um, you know, or we might need to put money into uh, treatments or something like that. If it's less than one already, we don't care. It'll take care of itself. I mean, we do care if, if it's deathly, you know, we, we care about those few people who get the disease, but it's gonna be really hard to mobilize support because there's only gonna be a few of them. And, you know, and once they get it, then they'll be the only ones who get it. So that's kind of what I mean by like, it takes care of itself. So, um, so if it's less than one, you, you wanna keep track of the ones who get it and take care of them, but you don't worry about it spreading. If it's greater than one, you actually have to maybe take efforts to prevent the thing from spreading. And so um, this, you can, you can interpret this two different ways. It's either the, uh, how frequently one individual infects others divided by how frequently they clear their infection or the other way around, um, how long they're infected divided by the average time in between contacts with a susceptible person. Both of those, so that's what R0 is. It's a ratio of those two things. All right, so, um, so now the, what you hear in the movies and the media or whatever is this interpretation. The average number of new infections caused by each infected individual during her infectious period. So when you hear about this being, um, the, the reason one is important in this interpretation is if it's less than one, then that means you added to the population, uh, you added to the infected population, but you're not, when you clear it, you're not going to add any more than you. Like if it, this is the point five, then that means that there's a 50% chance you're not going to get anybody else infected. Um, and you might get somebody infected, but then someone else who's infected may not get someone else infected. If this is two, then that means while you were the one guy with the infection, you got two other people sick. So even when you get cleared, you've left two left over. So that's where this, this interpretation comes from, is the, the number of people that you get sick while you're sick. That's another way to interpret or not. So... Um, so this is basically a quick summary for in a simplistic worst case scenario, we can use these r naughts to tell us whether uh, we, what sort of measures we might take from a public health perspective. And this all comes from thinking about, um, you know, disease spread in this formalized way. And you can go to Wikipedia and this is outdated. Uh, by this point, I think I downloaded it in 2020, uh, but you can find r naught values for a whole bunch of different diseases. Um, like I said, they can change over time as we get new technology, as we get more social awareness and so on. Um, and, um, and so there's several of things like flu. Um, it's anywhere between 0.9 and 2.1. So it's pretty close to one, but it's not, um, you know, the flu that we get, you know, the seasonal strains we get around here are pretty easy to control. Uh, but, you know, like, you know, diphtheria goes all the way up to 4.3 um, at this time. Um, this strain of COVID back in 2020 was being estimated to be very infectious. Um, you know, so um, polio, super infectious, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, so you can see that the higher this number, measles really infectious here, uh, then uh, the more you can imagine you really need, like, you really need a third party to get involved up here. Down here, people can probably take care of it on their own. Okay, so that's r not. So questions about that. So that's where r not comes from. Questions online? Okay. All right, so, um, okay, so what can we do with these models behind, beside this kind of abstract case? Can we do some sort of um, scenario planning? So I'm gonna borrow another uh, article from 2020. Um, so this idea here, if we zoom in on this article, um, they talk about um, 
you know, why do we, in computer modeling, it helps us understand how an outbreak might be unfolding. And, and this is kind of the important point, what we should be thinking through. And so it's not about predicting, it's more about this kind of scenario planning. So it really helps you think about things. It changes your thinking about these scenarios. And so the scenario planning example is what I'm gonna focus on here. So I've just um, modified this model just a hair. So we've got the depletion loop, the contagion loop, and the recovery loop exactly as before. And now we have a new loop that we've added, contact avoidance. And so this is a simple model of um, a basically of quarantine policy. So what we've got here is that um, what we can, we're gonna do is we add a lookup table. That's what the little curly brace that Stella means down here, or the little uh, squiggle, the tilde at the bottom of the variable name here. And this is going to implement a quarantine policy where it looks at the number of infected people and based on certain triggers, once you get a certain number of infected individuals, it is going to massively change the contacts per day. In particular, down here, um, I've got that the quarantine triggered at a certain size will reduce the contacts per day per infected person. So, um, and I'll see um, different scenarios here. So we can now play with no quarantine or a quarantine at 1,000 individuals for a 10,000 population, quarantine at 2,000 individuals for a quarantine population. So this is what we get by playing with this lookup table. And so um, our, this one, this is our baseline. So here what they do is they have, they cut the contact rate per day in half. So the idea here is that whatever these quarantine positive things are, you know, they start, you know, it could be, you know, they shut down stores or they start grabbing up as many people who are infected as possible and making sure that they stay away from others. And so um, these efforts will have a net effect of cutting the contact rate per day in half. And so the question is, when do you cut the contact rate per day in half? Do you um, never do it? That's the top line here. So we're looking at affected populations. So this is, again, number of infected plus recovered. And so it starts at zero and then it, it uh, you know, tops off here. So if I never do it, everybody gets infected. If I do it at 2000 infections, not that many people, not, there's all, not a whole lot of change. If I do it at 1000 infections, this is the, kind of the most aggressive, still not really that different. So in this case, like simply um, quarantine doesn't really change the number of susceptible spares. This doesn't affect really the herd immunity much at all, this kind of quarantining here, which is interesting to me. Like you would think like, you know, have a thousand infections. So this is saying when 10% of your population has, uh, has the disease, only 90% don't, you put in these, these measures which cut their contact rate in half and you end up not really making much difference in the end of how many people get sick or not. So, so that's kind of interesting. So maybe we're not plotting the right thing. So this is when we plot the infected population over time. So, um, and so we can see, we know it's hump shaped. So you get uh, groups that get infected, but then eventually it burns out and then they get cured here. And, um, and what, the, what we see here is although we reduce the peak, we lengthen the tail. And so the area underneath these, which is the number of people who actually get touched by this disease, doesn't change much. So again, the quarantine policy doesn't change much, but, and this is where you hear this flatten the curve all the time, what does change is the height of the peak. And so now we haven't modeled hospitals at all in this model, but we can take this simplistic model without hospitals in it, and we can complement it with our knowledge of the total capacity in ICUs or ERs or whatever. And we can say across here, we can say that, um, as long as I keep my infection peak under this critical level here, then I know that um, my hospitals are gonna be able to weather the storm. And if I go above that, the mortality from this disease will go way up. It'll be like a totally different model. It might be in a way worse than this. And I might need that death's flow. But as long as I keep it under here, I'm pretty sure I can keep the mortality in check. I'm not gonna have to worry about deaths. And eventually we wait long enough. We're gonna have to wait longer, but if I wait long enough, nobody's gonna die. So we see here, what does quarantine policy do? It doesn't affect the number of people who get the disease really, not much, but it does affect um, uh, whether the, the infrastructure can take the people. And that's why you hear this phrase, flatten the curve. It's not about keeping people from getting sick. It's about managing those who do get sick.
and everyone's going to get sick. But, you know, some people are going to get sick a lot later when, but the resources will be available. Instead of everyone getting sick at once, we spread it out. So some people get sick early and some people get sick late. That's what we learn about this model. So questions about that. And I guess we also sort of learned, so I got, so lesson one, I guess I missed that. If you really want quarantine to happen, um, I guess what I was trying to say up here is if you really count on quarantining, you got to do it super early. And so and now this is kind of interesting that as I can look at this, as it used to be all kind of hypothetical, but you can look at like, look at different countries and how they affect the, you know, how they approach SARS-CoV-2, you know, COVID-19. You know, like New Zealand, you know, a lot of these countries, you know, they cracked down like immediately and they kept the number of infected down to like zero. But now, but eventually they could only do that for so long. And they left so many susceptibles in their population that because they're, they eventually have exposure to others who didn't have that policy, then it uh, still allows the disease to spread like wildfire there. And they were seeing that in some of the, you know, the Eastern Asian countries now um, that they were so good at controlling it up front. There's so many countries that weren't good at controlling it up front. That's why you have to think of it as a global system that it didn't almost matter that they were so good at controlling it. So if you want to control it, everybody who could possibly be susceptible has to quarantine early and immediately. If you can't do that, the next best thing is to uh, manage this infection peak. And, um, and this maybe is the more practical way to go. Um, and, uh, and the goal here is not to prevent people from getting infected, but it's to make it so that those who do get infected survive the infection. So that's what we learn from this really simple model. All right, so it's not about predicting what's happening. It's about scenario planning. So we can wrap our heads over what's the right policy. Should we quarantine? And if we should quarantine, what outcome should we expect? Okay, so questions. Does that kind of example make sense? All right, so let's do a quick attendance exercise. I'll put the link in the chat. And the question here is give an example or not that would indicate a infectious disease and infectious disease will naturally die out without any intervention. Yeah, so give me a number, an example or not, that um, characterizes a, an infectious disease that will naturally die out, that doesn't need um, any extra intervention, it just manages itself. So I'm just looking for a number. And as a hint, I'm looking for either a number above one or below one. Okay. All right, so um, earlier in the class we said, well, is this the most realistic version of the model? And, um, and what sort of modifications could we make to it? So this is the simple baseline type of model for most infectious diseases. But of course, real, real infectious diseases vary from this quite a bit. So this is our SIR model. Now, you can imagine there's probably some diseases that have no recovered state. You know, like the common cold, you don't really get, I mean, you might get a little bit of immunity for a short amount of time, but you basically can go from being infected to susceptible. You, can, you know, it, you, could, you could pass it to somebody in your family and they could pass it right back to you um, if there are enough hops. And you could pass it to your partner, you could pass it to your child, and then you get right back and then you just constantly are you know, sick. And so this is a so-called SIS model, describes these types of diseases. And, um, and you can describe them mathematically. So this is uh, sort of the standard way to write it. But as we sort of learned, um, you know, any of these types of differential equation models can be written just as well as um, these stock and flow models. They're identical. And so here I have two stocks, S and I, and I have an infection rate going into I, but now the recovery rate doesn't go into an R, it goes just right back into S. And so I can, I can model this thing here. And if I simulate this, I get a trajectory and this is um, time. And this is the, uh, the I is the blue line that rises and the S susceptibles is the red line that falls. And what we find here is that for this type of model, I mean, the results kind of make sense here that there's always someone infected and there's always someone susceptible. 
you know, the, you never get, the infected's never burn out. There's always some, you know, a group out there that is spreading the disease. And there's always someone who's effectively recovered, but will someday get infected in the near future, which kind of makes sense there. So we could talk about how um, different policies for, um, you know, for, for intervening, in, you know, on this infection rate um, can change the steady state proportions of these two. We could talk, Gazuntai, we could talk about how, um, how the um, uh, medicines and things that might shorten the recovery time will also change the proportions here. And we could talk about for a given setup here, which one is a better thing to put our money into? Should we be funding more on these or more on these? And, um, and, and, you know, and so, so those are sort of things that we can do with a simple SIS model and you get rid of that R. The other thing is you could say, well, you do recover for a certain period of time, but then you get susceptible anymore. This is a so-called SIRS model, SIRS model here. I've lost my mouth, there it is. Um, and so, um, so you could model that. There's another set of models where you add an exposed group. So you are susceptible, you get the disease, but you're not infectious yet. So you're in this point where you're gonna be infectious. So we're not gonna count you as susceptible anymore. If it's gonna happen, you're gonna get it. Then when you're infectious, you, that's when you start spreading the disease and then you recover. That's a so-called SEIR model. And it's not that different from an SIR model, but it does change the window of time in which you're like the time when you're sick is a large window, but the time that you're spreading the disease is a small window. And that will greatly change the dynamics of the response. So that's kind of an important realism. And then of course you can add the loop back. You're recovered only for a certain amount of time. So there's a bunch of different things. So in fact, there's a whole Wikipedia page. If you go to um, uh, epidemic model or compartmental models in epidemiology, um, you know, it's just on this Wikipedia page, you can see um, it's got all these models that I've talked about and some that I don't, haven't talked about here. Um, there's uh, this model here, the MSIR model, where um, in this case, an individual is born with passive immunity from the mother. So, you know, that's an even more complicated thing there where, um, you know, so they said like, like with COVID, for example, they said that, you know, that, uh, that, you know, babies, you know, they actually inherit a little bit of immunity from their mother, but it wears off after a certain amount of time. So you could create a compartment where you've got, um, you know, if you've got this age structured population, the young maybe aren't susceptible until they get to a particular age. And that affects the spread of these dynamics. And so there's a bunch of different things that you can add to these models. And the question is sort of which one's best? And I like this quote from John Holland. Um, so this is, if you've ever heard of the genetic algorithm, uh, this is sort of the, the guy who founded, the, created this genetic algorithm, this tool that I actually teach about in another class. And it's very interdisciplinary, it uh, works in psychology, electrical engineering, and computer science. And as this quote, model building is the art of selecting those aspects of a process that are relevant to the question being asked. I mentioned that the SIR model is kind of as a worst case scenario. It's like generically, a lot of diseases act kind of like this as a baseline. So we can focus on that and it gives us generic insight across a wide range of diseases. You can then say, yes, but the common cold, you don't get recovered. And so you could say, yeah, okay, well then what might we, how might we perturb off of the SIR model? We could maybe need that SIS model to model it if you want to get really accurate, but we can still use the SIR as kind of a, a touchstone. It's sort of something for, for good boundary work, something we all can agree on that we can start from and come into as a center and then talk about these things. And then if we do find that we really care about more precise characterizations of the dynamics, you know, how do these things change? We're really close to that reproductive number of 1.0. If we, if, if, if we actually properly model this exposed state, maybe we actually find that we're not spreading it, even though we thought we might be spreading it or something like that. So it's really hard to know which one of these models to pick, but you have to kind of focus on the question that you're asking and what you're gonna do with that model afterwards. It's almost always the case that you don't need to throw in the kitchen sink of every single detail because a lot of times the insight you're looking at doesn't require all of that. So that's um, kind of things here. So we can make the SIR model more and more complex that's not a limitation, it's just a choice that um, for, um, for most of our discourse, the SIR model is enough. All right, so any questions about that? Kind of an example, this is, um, as those of you who started reading the chapter, you're gonna see that we can use very similar models 
to start building models of uh, marketing. So like who adopts the iPhone over the Android, um, Gesundheit, and then we're gonna specialize those. Like we're gonna add in advertising. There is no such thing as advertising in a disease model, but both of them can start as kind of a, something similar to an SI model or something like that. Um, but, um, but then when you add advertising, that's something specific to, um, to markets that sort of is a way where you can get people sick with your idea, even if initially you don't have a population who's sick. So, um, so that's kind of what we'll see in that chapter coming up. All right, so, um, so looking forward, uh, like I said, read chapter six for lecture E4. So that's uh, basically Tuesday. So, and uh, there's perusal assignments and so on that are associated with that. So that's what we're saying here, the reading exercise and the assessment and the perusal. Um, do Sunday, um, so the uh, muddiest point assignment, um, this short project proposal with your group, kind of tell me, uh, there's notes online on how to do that, what project you're aiming at, um, what are some of the variables that you think you, you'll need to uh, model, um, and if you can, even throw in a causal loop diagram, if you can, it would be great, um, it's not necessarily required. Uh, now, and you're not, and it's not a contract, so start out with something to show me you at least have got a place to go next so that I can feel confident letting you guys go. But then if you find out later, like, wow, it'd be a lot easier if we just modeled this other thing, you can change later. I'm not gonna check. So I just need you to show that you've got together and you've come up with a system that's plausible that you could move forward with. That's what we're doing in this proposal. And of course your muddiest points. So assignment E2 has been out. Um, so you still got a while to, to work on it. So basically it's not due this weekend, it'll be due next weekend. Uh, uh, two questions and one bonus, uh, how to use kind of sliders and lookup tables, how to use delays. And then the bonus is kind of a question um, related to sort of delays, a kind of more advanced question about delays. And for the final only one That's right. So you're all in groups and it's a group assignment. So over one person, your group has to upload and it'll count for both. Okay. All right, any uh, other questions? If not, and you can feel free to ask questions, but I'll give you your closing attendance exercise here and we'll get out of here a few minutes early. And a uh, question here um, is, um, what is the type of model called? What do we call the model where after your a brief period of recovery, you go back to being susceptible again? So I said that we, the model we've been talking about most of the, the, the period is SIR model, but if I have the R compartment, but then a little bit later, anybody who's recovered goes back to being susceptible, what's that model called? So it's not SIR, it's something else. And that's all I've got for you today. So if you have any other questions, please, I'll just put that in the chat. What is the model called? Here. Yeah. The genetic algorithm is that um is that where things evolve? Like you write a program, you can think things can be evolving within it. There, the, well, yeah. So the genetic algorithm is a way for um, if you have a complicated design problem, like yeah. I don't know the right number of lights and heaters and other things in a building, but I have a way to simulate what a building would be like under all sorts of scenarios. And so um, if it's a really large space, it's hard for me to consider every single scenario. I can have a computer, um, you know, do all of those, but it might, the simulation might take so long, you can't do all of them. So what the genetic algorithm would do is they'll try one and it'll try a population. It'll try 10 different populations. And then based on how well they work, it'll expand that. Um, so this dies out and then. Right, right. So it's that sort of idea where it's a high dimensional space um, and the things that are successful at driving along the, the, the thing will end up staying in the population, but those that um, are not successful get left behind. And those that are stay in the population reproduce. Yeah, it saved its template. Right, right. Cool, so this is it, cool. That, that, that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be optimizing kind of like a robot. And so, uh, but yeah, but you can also optimize kind of other, other things like, you know, the intake ratio for an, an engine or something like that. Genetic you teach class on it? Yeah, I have a class on bio-inspired AI and optimization where we talk is a lot a about. A... Yeah, I mean, we I once we'll get upper level um, underclassmen in there, but yeah, it's uh, I teach it every other spring, maybe every spring. So I teach it this spring, 
It's called CSE 598. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All the lectures are online in case you're interested. Ah, yeah. watch them. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions online? If not, I will go ahead and end the room. All right. See everybody next week. Have a good weekend.